Hebrews 11 verses 5 to 6. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Good morning. We're continuing our series in the Heroes of Faith from the book of Hebrews. Thank you, Mel, for reading those verses to us. When you think about the books and websites that influence your faith, the most important will probably be the Bible, and particular parts of the Bible especially, but not exclusively so. There will be those books that influenced you, perhaps as a young Christian, or at particular times in your faith journey, and they will sometimes be as significant or more so than parts of the Bible you rarely or have never read. In the world of the writer to the Hebrews, it was no different. He had the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch from which Genesis comes, the Psalms, the histories, the prophets, of course, and just as we do. But while he didn't have the New Testament, he was writing part of it, he did have the stories of Jesus that were circulating that would eventually become the Gospels. And he did share in the knowledge of books that we now barely remember or hardly know. Books, nonetheless, that in his day and in his world were as widely known as, say, Fox's Book of Martyrs or Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress in the 17th century. And among this literature, in a period that we call Second Temple Judaism, that's from about 100 years before the birth of Jesus and right up until the destruction of the temple in AD 70, in this literature are books about Enoch. The books of Enoch were originally written in Aramaic. Now, that's the language that Jesus would have spoken in his home and the disciples too. And it was translated into Ethiopian. Stay with me, please. Now, we don't need to worry about what these books say. It's rather strange and mystical literature that enjoyed high status among some Christian circles in the time of the writer to the Hebrews. Its source in Genesis, however, is tantalizingly brief. It was probably viewed as scripture by a community called the Qumran community. They left the Dead Sea Scrolls and Living in the wilderness, it's quite likely that they were very formative in developing the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, the forerunner of Jesus that we'll think about through Advent. But ultimately, the books of Enoch were rejected as scripture by the Western Church, so they're not in our Bibles. But in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, it's still a very, very significant set of books. Uh, you may know, if you know your New Testament well, that Enoch also gets a, mess, uh, a mention in the book of Jude. So while the readers of Hebrews encounter the example of Enoch in the writer's pantheon of faith in Hebrews 11, they know a lot more about Enoch than we do. They would remember much more than simply Christians today reading about Enoch in Genesis. Let's read it. It's in Genesis chapter 5 and verses 21 to 24. It simply says this. When Enoch had lived for 65 years, he became the father of, Mes of Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more, because God took him. All the preceding figures 
in the line from Adam in Genesis are described in a similar fashion. Their age when they had their firstborn, who is named, with a note about any other children that they had, and then their age from that birth until they died. And each story finishes with a little phrase, and he died. <laughs> the story is there to show how Abraham, the father of the faith of Israel, can trace his line back to Adam and the creation. But when we get to Enoch, the formula is changed. There is something about his character. He walked with God. And then there's the enigmatic, then he was no more. Or literally in the book in the Hebrew of Genesis, he was not. That sets him apart from his predecessors and some who follow afterwards. The only other figure in these early stories who walks with God is Noah. And this is what the writer to the Hebrews picks up on. Enoch walks with God and he does not seem to die. Now the manner of his departure fascinated people in the period of this Second Temple Judaism. And that gave rise to all manner of speculation about what he encountered when he was not and was taken up into heaven. Speculation that the Bible avoids. The writer of the Hebrew can hardly ignore it, and he gives the conventional interpretation of the Genesis story that Enoch did not die, but was taken up by God into heaven. But what is more important is that he doesn't speculate further. Now, many of the readers of the Old Testament in the Greek-speaking world wouldn't have read it in Hebrew, but a translation into Greek, uh, just as we have our Bible translated into English. And in the Greek, it simply says that he was translated. <laughs> he lived his life in a different language, the language of heaven. But there's, no, of the, there's none of this sort of esoteric speculation about what is hidden from our eyes for the writer to the Hebrews. What's more important to him is that we walk with God in this life. And the writer goes on to give a very pithy summary of what walking with God means. You believe that God exists, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the one with whom Enoch walked. So you begin by believing that he exists and secondly that he rewards those who seek him. The spiritual muscle that we exercise when we do both of those things is faith. In the ancient world, as even more so now, there were many who lived as functional atheists. They lived as if God did not exist, even if at moments of extreme fear or danger they remembered him and offered a prayer. I wonder how many of the millions of people who claim to be Christian in England and Britain today, or indeed around the world, also live as functional atheists. They don't give God a second thought from one day's end to the next, and only perhaps remember him at times of stress or strain. Now, the writer of the Hebrews knows that, as we know it in our own world, so he emphasizes that this faith that Enoch exercised is more than an occasional nod to the Almighty, a kind of a doffing of the cap from uh, one year, perhaps at Christmas or perhaps at Easter. But it's rather a life of continual exercise of active faith that draws us into a relationship with God. Now that brings with it its own reward. The reward of seeking God like this is that we find him. And Enoch is the example of such faith for the writer to the Hebrews. It's a life walked with God that brings with it the reward of eternal life. And for us, walking with God is expressed in a series of disciplines or habits, the things that we just do all the time, 
like you wash your hands very often these days, or brush your teeth, or comb your hair. Actually, I don't comb my hair, I don't need to, but that's another story. For us, walking with God is expressed in these disciplines or habits. That daily turning to God in prayer and the reading of scripture. That regular fellowship with Christ's church and attending weekly worship and the Lord's Supper, whether it's gathered together as we long to do or here online. It moves us on to serving in our world in daily living, bearing witness to Christ and our faith in him. It involves our loving our family and friends and neighbour and stranger and persevering in this way of life until we die, until we are not. As Sergei says in the adverts, simples. There's a new Nigella Lawson cookery show on at the moment called Cook, Eat, Repeat. You might say that the Christian life is a matter of pray, serve, repeat. Pray, serve, repeat. A daily pattern of living. It's not a case of having to wrestle with all manner of esoteric beliefs about angels and the nature of paradise or the way in which the world will end, fascinating though these things might be. But it's simply a matter of walking with God. Walking with God by faith and living out that trusting obedience to his ways, knowing that because of his love, God rewards those who trust in him with the gift of eternal life. Not just life after we die, but that gift of eternal life which is already active and at work in our lives now. Jesus in John 17 gets to the heart of the matter when he prays, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Two children's choruses from my childhood sum it up. The first is trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Some of the older members of this church and those listening may remember that. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. And the chorus, trust, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We sang the, the hymn in church but the chorus in Sunday school. But the other song from my childhood is the answer that the greatest theologian of the 20th century, perhaps the greatest th theologian since Calvin and Luther, gave to a student at a question and answer at a seminar towards the end of his life in Chicago in 1962. The theologian, of course, is Karl Barth. His church dogmatics runs to many volumes, and you can see on the screen the volumes of these church dogmatics, the story of the Christian faith. I've got about half of them on my bookshelves, and it takes quite a big chunk. I bought them when they were being given away, or rather sold very cheaply, at the first ever Baptist assembly I went to when I first began ministry. What a find. Well, he had spent his life as this great, profound theologian, and the student asked him, could you summarize, Professor Bart, the whole of your life's work in theology? And Bart thought for a moment and replied, yes, I can. In a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You see, great and profound theology can be summed up in some simple but deeply profound beliefs about God and Jesus and his love for us. There is the core of believing faith that we see in the example of Enoch. That's what we're called to exercise day by day until, like Enoch, in some way or another, we are no more 
on this earth and we are brought into God's presence. Walking with God means knowing him and that's reward enough.